another episode of Power Move Makers. This series was created with a simple goal in mind, to bring to the table high-level executives, successful entrepreneurs, and all around just inspiring human beings, not just focusing on their successes, but more important, shining a spotlight on the road they traveled to get there. Now this week's guest, he comes in by popular demand. Because of my background and long history in the music industry, people are hitting me up constantly asking me the same question. Sean, can you listen to my demo? Sean, can you put me in touch with an A&R? Sean, how do I get a record deal? And I'm not the one to answer those questions anymore. So I brought on an expert in that area, the Vice President of A&R at Atlantic Records, Success. Welcome to the show. What's up, brother? Oh, uh, man, thanks for having me, my man. Appreciate you uh, bringing me on and being able to answer some of the questions and, and you know, some of the concerns of up and coming artists. Um, so yeah, I appreciate you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm really happy that you gave us the time. So I'll just say that up front. There's gonna be a lot of people watching this. Everybody out there knows your name because you're highly sought after. In the music industry, we all know the a and person is probably the most sought after person in the game. You are the gatekeeper to damn near changing somebody's life, taking them from obscurity to making them into hopefully a household name that everybody in the world knows their music. So before I get into some of the questions that I'm hit with all the time, let's just talk about you for a second. How did you even get in the business? What was your journey into the game? Uh, that's a good question. So um, I'm, I'm born and raised in Chicago, um, South Side. I was like anybody else. I was a hip hop kid. I, you know, break dancing, graffiti. um, And then, you know, even I used to throw house parties as a, as a teenager. Um, So that was my, my first introduction into, into hip hop. Uh, Separate from that, I was also a musician. I played, um, I played drums growing up. My parents were super, Afrocentric, so they kept us, um, you know, super, super cultural. So I played like African, West African drums and that sort of thing um, on the creative side. But that had nothing to do with the hip hop side, which was more so me doing, like I said, the parties, party promoting, um, you know, break dancing. I was a part of a hip hop crew, all that. So fast forward, I went to college at Florida A and M. Um, in late 90s and it was while I was at FAMU that I started sort of rapping um I was a part of a rap group down there and you know we pretty much toured the south southeast um from Atlanta to you know back and forth to Miami Alabama all these different places um but what I started noticing was that I you know I sort of um I like the behind the scenes side a little bit more. Like I was the one booking the shows. I was the one routing the tours. I was the one negotiating the the bags that we were getting for these shows locally. I was the one pitching our songs to the radio stations, et cetera. So I kind of took a liking to the administrative behind the scenes side. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, that was, that was college. In 2002, I moved to New York from, Tallahassee and at the time you know I was friends with like guys like John Monopoly, Kanye, Don C. These were my boys from home and Kanye had just kind of moved to New York around the same time. So when I got here me and Kanye connected he kind of brought me around at the time it was Baseline Studios so like everybody from Rockefeller was at Baseline so I met Hove and I met you know, Beanie Siegel, Memphis Bleak, all those guys, Lenny S. Um, and, you know, Just Blaze, um, Cam, all the dip set. It was, you know, Rockefeller was like right, lit right. at that time. Um, so what I started doing was I became like the liaison between the producers because Kanye comes from a team of like producers in Chicago that had a similar sound. Um and when he started, remember, he started off as a producer, but then he started blowing up as an artist. 
then guys wanted that same sound that he had given like Jay-Z on Blueprint. So what I did was being that I'm from Chicago, but I was living in New York. I was like, let me go back and reach out to some of these producers and start representing them because now the industry is up on that sound with the soulful samples and the flips. So I started managing some of the producers, bringing that sound to, to, the, to the industry. Um, and I would say I went from managing producers to managing songwriters, a couple artists here and there. Um, and once, you know, once, once you're doing that again, this is before Instagram and Twitter and that sort of thing. It was just, you had to really get to know these guys from the execs, the A&Rs, the artists, artist managers. Um, and once you, you know, you start developing those relationships, then I was dealing with a lot of the labels and that was pretty much my intro into the, into the industry. Um, but, but how started- did you get, how did you get in the building? Because that, that's the, you know, it's one thing to be on the outside. Anybody can pick up tomorrow and say, hey, I want to manage talent, right? Right. There's no real qualifications for that. If you're a hustler and you're somebody who doesn't take no for an answer, you'll probably get your artist signed or you'll get your beat sold. Right. How did you get into the building and ultimately get the position? Because you, 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 right now, you're a big wig. Your name yeah. rings bells. Everybody wants to get a meeting with you. How did you climb the ranks to become the VP of um, A&R at Atlantic Records? That's a good question. And I, I tell people, you know, I'm definitely a hustler at heart. And, and when I look at hustling, I look at it from the smart, work smarter, not harder, right? So I'm like, okay. Here's the other thing that I did, right? So when Kanye brought me to Baseline, at the time I was a sneakerhead. I was a sneaker enthusiast. This was before all of the resellers was really killing it and and you know, it was it was going crazy the way it is now. So at the time I I had certain resources where I could get exclusive sneakers for the low and that was part of what I had. So like you know, I would go do a meeting with Fab and Clue at the studio and I'm, I'm selling Fab and Clue some sneakers and I'm also giving him a beat tape at the time. (laughs) I like that. (laughs) (laughs) So Fab, all these guys start calling me like, yo, Jada Kiss, you know, these guys start calling me and I was known as the dude with the kicks as well as the beats. So that's really when you talk about, you know, Anybody can like come up to you and they come up to me and be like, bro, listen to my demo. I'm dope. Check out my music. But it's like, I figured out, okay, Just Blaze is a sneakerhead, you know, Skane, Dollar, and Clue are sneakerheads. Fab, all these guys, everybody was, was, was excited about sneakers. So my angle was not just music. It was like, okay, come with the fire, which... The, the tangible item is this sneaker. They're going to buy this sneaker. But because I have that relationship now, let me pitch some music. And, you know, they're going to at least give me the opportunity to press play. If they press play and they hear something they like, oh, now it's lit. Now I'm like, okay, I'm in there. And I start building that relationship. So now they're like, okay, this guy definitely has an ear. So every time I would come through with kicks, it would also be like, yo, play me some new heat. So then, you know, that that was my angle. And I tell people, don't come up to me and just say, yo, check out my beats, I'm dope, or check out my music. You got to, like, figure out something that we have in common or something that's going to make me want to hear it outside of just everybody that's coming up saying, yo, check out my music, I'm dope, I'm dope. So my angle was working smarter, not harder, and just figuring out, okay, this guy, of course, this is a gatekeeper, but how do I also impress this person with something outside of simply just saying here, please listen to my music. Because a lot of times these guys are busy. They don't, you know, if you're on an elevator and you got your elevator pitch, what's going to make you stand out? What's going to make me be like, okay, I definitely got to go press play on this because that kid made such an impression on me that I feel like I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and at least go press play. And so, that was my strategy. Again, it wasn't Instagram. So, so, so let me ask you something, and I'm sorry to cut in here. 
Uh-huh. Because this is a you you're touching on something I was going to touch on later in the interview. And I know I, I asked you earlier, how did you actually get your position? So we'll mm-hmm. go back to that. But if I'm a kid right now, right, and I see you on the street, and I'm like, oh my God, that's success. Mm-hmm. How do I get your attention? Because I got to believe people are emailing you every day. Your inbox is cluttered. I don't know if you, and you can even answer that. Do you, yeah. you know, go through your emails and actually listen to artists and listen to beats? But if I just happen to bump into you, and I know when I was coming up in the um, record industry, we would actually go stand outside of the record labels. And I would know how the a and R's looked. As soon as yeah. I saw them, I would pounce all over them. Does that <laughs> approach work? Like, how do I get your attention? That approach is the, the guerrilla style approach. And believe it or not, they still do that. They post up outside the building. Um, and yeah, sometimes cats know who we are, me specifically, they know who I am. Um, I'm super low key and and I'm one of the humbler guys that I'm, you know, I just do my thing. I'm not one of these flashy, you know, I I just, I'm super humble, chill, but, but like, yeah, if you approach me, I'm going to give you an opportunity. But again, our conversation has to be memorable enough where it's like, okay, if he's saying certain things that it's like, okay, you know what? I'm going to give this kid a shot. I'm going to go upstairs and I'm going to press play based how, on that. How often does that happen for you? Probably once a week, right? That somebody Frequently. actually comes with a memorable introduction to you. Their sales okay. pitch is on point that you yes. say, I'm, I'm at, you know what? I loved your approach. I'm really going to go upstairs and listen to this now. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, again, I was that guy. So I, 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 you know, I look at things like, you know, everything happened for a reason. So I'm like, you know what? There was a reason I was supposed to meet this kid right this moment. And so I'm going to give him a shot. I'm going to go press play. Now, rather than not, it makes it to the next meeting or a kid actually gets signed. I can say there's been a lot less of that, but I definitely give cats a shot. I go through my emails again, because I was a producer manager first. I'm the guy that's going to go through and listen to all the beats. I'm going to go and, and, you know, I may not get right back to you in a day or two, but, you know, I, I'll catch up with my emails. It might be a week or two later, and I'm still going through my emails, and I'm going to hit you back. Like, yo, this is fire. This is okay. Send more. Because people have to understand, it benefits us to find you. So it's like, you know, Cass is like, yo, how do I get a deal? And it's like, I tell people, listen, my job depends on me finding you and discovering your talent and helping you take that to the next level. So it's just as much important for me to find you as you're looking for this deal. And so I tell people, all you got to do really is put your music out, start connecting with a fan base, and we will find you. The days of begging for a deal, yo, you know, it's a different game now, like, Artists are putting out their music. They're putting it on DSPs, you know, digital streaming platforms. They're putting together marketing plans and rollout plans. Visuals are dope. And, you know, they're getting brand partnerships and alliances. And it's our jobs to go out and be like, yo, I've been watching this kid. He's been consistent. The music is good. The visuals are dope. I want to get a meeting with this kid. And that's really that organic approach. Is, is what's getting artist deals now. We want to be in business with artists who are moving like an independent, not the guys that's begging for the label that still think the label is going to, you know, is going to determine your destiny. Like, no, nah, we want to see the people that's out there, you know, doing shows when shows open back up, putting out music consistently, shooting dope videos, rolling it out and, and building, you know, the numbers may not be crazy this time, but, a month later, they dropped another one. And a month later, they dropped another one. Those are the guys that we're paying attention to. To all my movers, if you love educational and inspirational content just like this, please like, comment, and subscribe to this channel. But most important, if you know anybody making power moves just like you, share it. Now back to the video. Okay, so let me play devil's advocate. <clears throat> If I'm already moving, if I'm an artist out there and I'm doing my thing, I'm on your radar, why do I even need a record deal at this point? 
Like, I understand if you caught me before I had mm -hmm. the streets on fire, before I had streaming numbers going crazy and people right. were streaming my name. Right. You know, what can you bring to me as a record label that I can't do for myself? Right. Well, that's a, that's a really good question. And I think in this climate, there's going to be examples of both, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody says, oh, Chance the Rapper did it. You know, he's independent. He did it by himself. And that's fine. You know, Chance, I know Chance, you know, it's the homie from Chicago. But the reality is Chance in, ended up doing a situation with Apple Music. And that situation became really beneficial for him. Um, so I'm not going to say that the labels are the only way to go, the major labels, right? Because there's independents like your Alamos and your Asylums and Empires that are doing a great job, right? But I think that, you know, labels like Atlantic are still making superstars. And I feel like you're right. If you're independent and you're putting it out and you're getting fans and your music is streaming, you can, you can do that route. Typically, and traditionally, that route takes a little longer to get superstar. Mm -hmm. We can name a few examples, probably on one hand, of guys that absolutely stayed independent for the whole time and their household names, right? Um, but I think that labels, major labels specifically, are still able to get you there faster, get you there with a team. I know Atlantic, we have three to 400 employees around the world. So at any given moment, you got this team of 400 people working on your project, you know, on the marketing side, on the A&R side, um, you know, every aspect, merch, touring, um, you know, publishing, we're doing, you know, endorsement deals, you know, all of these different things that, that we're able to do at a faster rate. I'm not going to sit here and say the indie labels can't do that or that indie artists can't do that because you're right with, with social media and, and platforms these days, artists can go directly to the consumer. But I just feel like when you look at the, the stars and the, you know, the top 10 billboard artists around the world, majority of those guys have a major label or a real campaign behind it or machine. And so guys that want that machine, they figured out that the majors can help me get there faster. If you want, if it's all about your, you know, your entrepreneurship and, and, and staying indie, I, I encourage that as well. I just feel like certain artists do better at some of the majors and then other artists do better taking that independent route. Okay, fair enough. So let's explore this a little bit. Name some artists that you personally have signed. Um, so I recently signed YBN Namir. I signed Corday, YBN Corday, formerly known as YBN Corday. He's now Corday. I signed YBN Almighty J. I signed a young lady from Memphis, Tennessee, by the name of Juicy Fruit, who's making noise right now. She's really on the on the come up um, in the dance hall space. A few years ago, I signed a kid named Cranium from New York by way of Jamaica, who's who's doing really well. Um, who else have I signed recently? I signed a young lady by the name of Raven Lene from Chicago, who's who's doing really well. Um, we can stick if, if, if you want, because I, I just want to pull a point because I, I try to ask questions that my audience would want to know. So okay. you, you, you've done great. You signed the whole YBN crew, you know, Almighty J, Namir, now Corday. You know, Corday is one of the biggest guys, new guys in the game. I'm right. sure you guys are expecting huge things from him. Mm -hmm. What, again, to the earlier part of the conversation, because right. this is a real life example. When you got these guys, they were not where they are today. Correct. So what was it that you, like, is part of your job description, what did you do to help bring them to the masses as an A&R? Um, well, I think 
the first one was Namir. Um, I'll give it to Lemire, Namir that when I when I signed him, he had he was already on his way. He had a record called Rubbing Off the Paint that and a video that was going viral. And, you know, he had guys like Chris Brown. Everybody was reposting it. And so when I when I discovered it and then, you know, by the time I was able to close the deal with with the team, he was signed to, you know, James McMillan and Art at War and that corporation. By the time we closed the deal, about a month later, the the skill set came in at how do we capitalize off his momentum? bring him into the building and then keep that momentum going. Because oftentimes, especially artists that go viral, they get a viral moment. And after a day or two, there's a new guy that's going viral. So it's like the strategy was to get the deal done and sort of add, you know, fire to that flame that he had already created and help take that to the next level. So with Namir, like I said, we signed him. We put him in the studio right away um, and we were able to catch the next record because rubbing off the paint was already going crazy. It was like yep. Yep. at one point it was like 500,000 a day on YouTube. It was going crazy. It hit a million. But then what we noticed was, you know, and then once he got into the system, we went to radio and it was moving. But then he caught this new record um, called bounce out with that. And, while rubbing off the paint was still doing its thing, bounced out, sort of like took off like wildfire. And so from a label standpoint, even, you know, myself included, we had to be like, okay, do we stay in it with rubbing off the paint or do we shift gears because bounce out is, you know, it's, it's projected to do even better than rubbing off the paint. And so we switched gears and needless to say, we, you know, that was a great, a great, great move because we ended up getting two double platinum singles. We put out the YBM mixtape off the momentum of that over a billion stream. you know, so sometimes it's just about catching that, that momentum, especially if the artist is able to, to do that on their own. Like I give all the credit to him and his team. We were not a part of making that first record go viral, but what we were a part of is catching that momentum bringing that into the building and putting all of our resources in place to help him become, you know, a, a, a kid superstar. star, you know, superstar. So um, now in that regard, I'm not saying that an independent wouldn't have been able to do that, but having that staff and that team and those resources to, to just catch that and, and take that to the next level is, is something that we pride ourselves in. And, and, you know, um, Cause you know, again, these viral moments happen every day, but how do you turn a viral moment and not, not have what they call a one hit wonder? How do you then take that and create a real artist, you know, a, a career artist out of that moment? And I feel like that's what we've, you know, we've, we've done with the YBN collective. Okay. You, you mentioned James McMillan, legendary yep. attorney in the music industry. Yep. Is it necessary, in your opinion, is you know, for for indie artists to hook up with attorneys or production companies or have management in place in order to get to you? Is that something for you? Because obviously, James McMillan, he's been doing what he's been doing for for so many years on such a high level. It's very easy for him to get a meeting with success. Mm -hmm. Would you recommend all indie artists go out there and find established managers, established attorneys, um, get a team, or just get your buzz up, just get your weight up, get people talking about you, and then we're going to come find you? Well, I think, I think it depends on the artist, and, and I've seen cases of both, right? I say if you, if you feel like your team is strong, right? And when I say team, the very basic minimum – to have is your your day-to-day -day manager, right? He might be homeboy management. He came up with you. Y'all went to school together or he's off, he's off the block. But if he possesses those qualities that he, he speaks well, good communication skills, he's able to get you in rooms that you're not able to get yourself in. And, and he's, he's a good represent 
representative of, of you and your talent, then listen, I'm all about giving a guy a chance. But if you get to a point where you're not seeing progress, he's dropping the ball, you're missing appointments, he can't get you those meetings or in those rooms, he can't get you access to other creative producers or features or what have you, then it may be time to look for somebody with a little bit more muscle coming in the game that's like, you know what? Because I, I find that, again, you at least need somebody speaking for you who can get you in places you can't get yourself. And to a certain extent, they should have some relationship skills. And, and you know, they should have a Rolodex, which is able to make some calls um, if they can. Now, I've also seen guys that didn't have relationships. They were brand new, but they had a vision and they had great marketing skills and and they were executing you know uh release schedules and putting projects together and they were able to do that in a way that the labels came to them and so i don't i don't think there's a right way or a wrong way i just feel like again you have to be real with yourself if you're if your team is good then you know and and you're seeing progress and you think that they're able to take you to the finish line then Listen, by all means, we love seeing young executives being created because we got to pass the torch to the next generation. But again, right. you also got to be realistic with yourself and say, you know, I know you, my boy, you've been down from day one, but we get to that point where I don't think you can take me to the level where I need to go. So there's a few different ways you can as a team, you can go and say, let's go find somebody who is capable of taking us where we need to go. Um, you know, and, and so I, I just think you got to be realistic with yourself because you don't want to stifle your own career because you're trying to be loyal to the homies when at the end of the day, you know, it's no love lost. But I mean, I'm taking this seriously. I've sacrificed and I'm, I'm doing all the things for my career. And if you are not the guy that can take me there, it may be time to find somebody who can. Um, and I think the homies would have to understand because that, you know, you got to just like you got to be real. They got to be real with what they're able to do. And then same thing on the attorney side, you should definitely get a good attorney. You know, James is a good attorney. There's attorneys that are act, that are out there um, and you should know who they are and how to get to them. Because if you're serious about it and you're starting to see progress in your career, you're definitely going to need a good entertainment attorney who can help you close some of those deals and, and get some of those deals done. Okay, great. We got a lot to cover. I know time is um, not on our side, so I'm going to shoot some questions at you that I think the audience would want to know. Okay. okay, you get to the point that uh, you are ready to sign an artist. Yep. What do these deals look like these days? You know, uh, artists come, the, the artists that you're signing, I know money is being pumped back into the game. That, that drought that you know, the industry went through from maybe 05 to about 15 is kind of, you know, there's money back in the game now. For sure. You know, are you signing artists to single deals? Are you signing them to, you know, full album deals now? If so, what do those deals look like? Are they 360 deals? If they are 360 deals, do artists have any negotiating power whatsoever to be like, nah, I don't want to, I don't want to sign a 360 deal. What do the deals look like these days? Um, I think you're right. The, it is good to see the industry is making money again. You know, rev there's more revenue streams coming in with streaming and, 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 you know, some of the endorsement deals. Um, we're not definitely at Atlantic. We're not doing singles deals, right? If you okay, stop there for a second. Cause I want you to say that again. I didn't even realize that. At Atlantic Success, VP of a &R, you are not doing single deals? We don't do single deals. We may do an EP deal. You know, if let's say there's a kid that we, we believe in the song and we haven't quite figured out if, if this kid is a career artist, right? We're going to say, boom, let's do an EP deal, right? Mixtape with an option something like that. That way it gives him the freedom where if it's not working out, boom, you know, you're free to go and continue your career and, you know, we're, we're free to release you. Right. Um, 
So there are some EP deals happening. And then we are definitely still doing full on album deals, right? Um, two, three albums. Every deal is going to be different. It's going to depend on where you are in your career. Um, you know, you definitely still want leverage coming in the game, just like anything. It, it is a business. So if you're scorching hot, you know, and you just need a partner that's going to help you bring it to market and, 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 and get you on top 10 on Hot 100, you know, then your leverage is going to be that much better coming into the building. So, you you know, you're probably going to get a higher advance and your attorney and the power of your negotiation skills will get you the type of deal that you want. Are we doing 360 deals? Yeah, I think 360 deals are becoming an industry standard for some years now because again, especially a company like Atlantic, we're going to make sure that we're getting you in those Super Bowl commercials. You know, Corday on his first project out, he got two Grammy nominations. He got a Super Bowl deal. He's got a Coke endorsement, you know, because we were able to bring those type of deals. He's got a Puma endorsement. So it's like, it's not just like, oh, we just want to sign you to 360 because we want to take all of these other forms of revenue. It's like, no, we're going to help you go and get that big check from this corporation. And we're going to help you go and get that, that huge tour. And, and, you know, so, so we're, we're, we're putting these opportunities in front of the artists um, and, and then, yeah, we like to participate on, on a lot of these, um, a lot of these platforms. So yeah, we're doing three sixties, we're doing EP deals and we're doing album deals. Okay, great. You touched on something. I want to go back to it for a second. You said you're signing them for two and three albums. Um, you know, back in the days people were being signed for five to seven albums. Is the industry norm now two to three albums, or is that just with artists who have leverage and power? I think, again, every artist is going to be different. I can, I've seen different deals where some guys may have three albums, you know, requirement. A lot of guys, majority will have a four or five album uh, delivery requirement. Um, and then nowadays what you see is you see artists putting out mixtapes and you put out a mixtape and there's a certain threshold that that tape needs to stream. And, you know, you see guys like Future and Drake put out a collaborative project and it counts for both of their album requirement because it streams so much. Like there's so many different creative ways that deals are happening nowadays and artists and labels are getting creative with the delivery requirements. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, a standard deal is probably going to be four or five albums. Um, but again, based on your leverage, where you are, what you, you know, what you, what you're putting out, the, the, the frequency and, and how much you're putting out. Some guys are putting out one project per year. Some guys are putting out, you know, one mixtape per quarter. And it's streaming like a real album. So obviously those guys will be out of their delivery requirement a lot sooner. So there's no real standard on that, I feel like. Um, I feel like that's going to depend on the power of negotiation with you and your attorney. But um, I would say on average right now, it's a two to five uh, album deal requirement these days. Got you. Let's yeah. talk events. While we're on the subject, is yeah. there a standard in terms of the advance that the artists are getting? Um, and if so, what is the advance? And speak for, obviously, I would know this, but I'm speaking for somebody who's coming up, who's in middle America, who may not have any way to get this information outside of watching or listening to this video on podcast form in hearing right. your words, you, you know, is there a, a, an average for an advance? What's that based on? Um, and, and what is the advance used for? Do they have to pump it back into the album or can they take it and buy their mom a house? <laughs> I hope, I mean, I never encourage artists to go buy moms that house with that first advance, right? That's never a good thing. Um, I understand getting stable. 
you know, now you can quit the day job and, and now you have a few, you know, your, your bank account looks nice. You can pay off some debt, pay some bills, but like artists have to understand that advance is not the win, right? People think, yo, I got the deal. I got that advance. Now my life changed. Advances don't change lives. I'll, I'll just say that. that. I know that's a big misconception. When I was coming up, it was all about getting that advance, getting that check, getting that bag from the label. And it's like, that's really just the start of the relationship. So you should use that advance to get yourself situated, get an apartment, get it, get, you know, if you can put down on a house because you have other f- revenue coming in, that's one thing, but don't go trick off your advance on a house. Um, because again, that advance does need to be paid back. It is a recoupable advance and you know, you, you got to, you should be using that money to do other things to further your career. And I tell people that all the time, like, you know, get yourself situated, buy yourself a little in the crib studio set up so you can record demos at home. That's what majority of artists are doing. So when you get a situation like when COVID hits artists, what they couldn't do was get on the road, but what they were able to do, those that had a home set up, they was able to just record, record, record. And you can do that for, you know, 5,000 or less. You could get a nice little home set up and work and create. Um, so to answer your question, um, artists advances these days vary. Um, again, it is going to depend on, I feel like where you are when we're doing a deal and the power of you and your attorney's negotiation, right? It can be anywhere, you know, they're doing advances. I've seen deals as low as 50 K for a EP, you know, and I've seen them as high as, 1.5, 2 million for a full on album deal. So every artist is going to be different. Everybody's going to have a different, a different leverage. Um, and again, those advances are recoupable. So, you know, it, you should look at it like an investment, like a loan and it does need to be paid back. So, you know, um, definitely get you an accountant, as soon as you start talking about advances, you need to get a business manager because you don't want to owe the IRS and you don't want to, you know, you don't want to, that's another tricky thing to get, to get caught up in advances. And now you got show money coming in and you got all these other revenue streams coming in and you don't have a good business manager to help you with your finances and your accounting. Um, so I feel like just as important as your entertainment attorney is a good business manager to help you, you know, pay that out. And the other thing is nowadays with 360 deals, your business manager should also help you be able to account back to the label because as those other revenue streams start coming in, your partnership with the label needs to also be, you know, uh, taken care of and allocated. So super important to get a good business manager to help you with your finances. Gotcha. So just for my own clarity, the advance, it is for the artist's pocket. I understand you recommend that they invest in their career, get a setup, mm-hmm. do the right thing with their money. Right. But the advance itself is separate from the recording budget, correct? Correct. Okay. I just want to yeah. make sure for anybody who's watching this and, you know, because that that's a big question that I'm always asked. You know, do I if you're saying you've seen it as low as fifty thousand dollars, am I supposed to create an album, pay producers, book studio time, and still live off that one advance? Well, that's different. See, you know, there are certain deals where you you know you might have just a distribution deal, and with this distribution, they may say you know, here's a hundred thousand all in. So with that hundred thousand in that situation, then yeah, that's, you're supposed to live off of that. And then you're supposed to clear your records with that. Right. We're not doing too many of those deals at Atlantic records, Atlantic records. We have a whole admin team and you know, your advance is separate from your recording budget 
or your recording fund. Um, I'm just saying that the way artists live these days, you should be smart. I recommend being smart about your events because again, take for instance, what happened this year, artists are used to getting on the road and majority of their revenue comes from road life, you know, performances, shows, tours. But when, you know, when, when the pandemic hit, just imagine that if you had just signed a deal in, you know, let's say December of last year and March comes and everything shuts down and there's no shows that advance is what you're living off of because, Correct. you know, you could have a hot record, but no shows. So <laughs> guys that have, have been on the road for the last few years, hopefully they've been stacking some money because they've made that show money. But to a new artist that just got an advance, you know, now that you, you got to supplement some of that income that you would be getting from shows, you might have to tap into your savings. And so that's why I recommend that advance, putting it somewhere for savings for a rainy day, or just, you know, to invest in yourself. Like I believe in, you know, putting it into yourself. Like the label's going to do their part. We're going to do our part. But again, if you're at, you know, if, if, if you can't get shows and you still want to put out product and you still want to do what you want to do, you know, part of that could be used from your advance money. So um, for clarity, it is two different things though. Your advance is your advance. You really do what you want. I just recommend being smart about that um, because anything could happen at any moment. I understand. Here's another common question I get. Yeah. Do, well, I'm speaking to you, so I'll ask you personally, and I'll also put make this general. Everybody, you know, they, they are given this A&R title, junior A&R. Um, they work in the A&R department. Do you have signing power? Because people are shopping their demos. They are running up on anybody who has A&R next to their name. But what is the process on the inside? Where does the buck stop? Even with yourself, you're mm -hmm. vice president. Do you have to go back and share it with the upper echelon of the company and say, look, you know, I believe in it, but y'all give me the final green light? Or does the buck stop with you? And then people who are not necessarily a and uh, vice presidents, where does the buck stop with them? You know, are people wasting their time even speaking to somebody on a lower level? Should they fight to just get a meeting with you? What does that signing power look like in an organization like Atlantic? Um, so for the, the way we work, A&R, we all report to the chairman, Craig Kalman, right? So on the A&R side, everybody has the authority to go directly to Craig and say, listen, Craig, I feel strongly about this. Um, you know, here's, here's why I feel strongly about it. I think it would be a good fit for us. I think it works with our system. And, you know, Craig is pretty lenient about allowing you to execute, you know, execute your vision. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we, you know, sometimes he may not understand what we saw in something or maybe he doesn't get it and, and he'll give you, he'll give you the opportunity to, to, to go and say, okay, I need to prove myself on this. I believe in it. You know, I'm gonna lay on the sword for this one. And again, we can't win them all, but as an A&R, yes, I have power to sign. I can sign it. Um, and Craig can be just as excited as I am about it. Or he may be like, uh, okay, that's cool. I, I don't get it, but you're passionate about it and I brought you here for a reason. So I'm a, I'm gonna go off the strength of you and your passion and, and we can go get that done. Um, so Craig is a, is a really good, um, uh, chairman in that he, he allows us to, to see a vision and execute it. Um, you know, and, and I've seen cases of both. I've seen cases where it was a no brainer for Craig and Julie and, 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 and Kaiser, the whole marketing team. And then I've seen other things where 
certain people were scratching their head like, um, I don't know, but if, you, <laughs> if you're telling me that's what it is, I'm going to go off the strength of you, and we're going to give it a shot, and don't prove me wrong. So um, that that's pretty much how that goes. Everybody, you know, there's different levels. Uh, like you said, I'm a VP. Prior to that, I was a director. Um, I came in as a consultant, and then I went directly to director, and then I went to VP. Other people came in as like a manager, and our manager, and then they became a director and, and worked their way up. So um, there's different levels to it, but any a rs in our system has the authority to go to Craig, who's the chairman, and say, yo, I'm excited about this. This artist is doing this. He's building a fan base. He's selling out shows. He put out a project, and it's, it's growing, and Craig's going to look at whatever you're, you're presenting, and he'll give you his thoughts um, and, and kind of go from there. Can you give me some artists that you personally have passed on? And I ask you this, uh, A&R, you, you're human, right? Yeah. You, you did it the right way. You just named all of the different levels that you had to climb mm -hmm. to get this VP title. But I know, you know, if you're a coordinator or you're a direct, even if you believe strongly in something, it's your name, it's your reputation. It is, damn, if I get this wrong, are they gonna let me sign something else? <laughs> um, you know, yeah. all of these things are, you're human. You, 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 you finally made it into the game, right? but you might be slow to pull the trigger on some things, which I have noticed a lot of A&Rs are. What are some, yeah artists that may have come across your desk that you're like, damn, I just wish that I believed not just in the artist, but even in myself at that point, that I would have took the risk, went into the office and said, look, I'm, 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 I'm a better on me. I want Cause I know that is, that is something you have to grow to, to get that kind of confidence because your job is on the line. Every time you sign something in, it may not work. Right. So who have you passed on? Um, <laughs> that's, a, that's a, that's a good one. Um, so let me, okay. So Cardi B, right. I didn't pass on Cardi, but I had an opportunity to get Cardi early and I'm going to just keep it a buck and say that at the time, I may have overlooked it. Um, and so now I'm just like, see? <laughs> 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 but the good thing is we still got it in the building. So it yes, wasn't like. <laughs> yes, you did. It's to it later. And I still, work, I still worked on the project. I got plaques with Cardi. So I, I, but I just felt like, and, and you know, Daryl, Brooklyn, Johnny, those are my guys for years, my homies. But like, and Shaft, the, but like at the time I could have, when it was still being developed, I could have gotten it early, but I also think maybe it wasn't ready yet. It was still in development. So to see where she's become and how she's rolled out perfectly, I'm also like, you know what, maybe it was good the way it happened, the way it did, because it was sort of presented in a way like, yo, check out what I'm developing. It ain't ready yet, but, watch me closely and then by the time it came back around it was already in the building so that's one that I could say that you know um when she was still on like love and hip-hop and the, it was presented where I could have I could have put it together but I didn't right so that's one that I'm like but again it's still a win for the building it's still one for the team those are my guys and so I, I'm not tripping on it but that's one Another example, Chance the Rapper. Um, again, I'm from Chicago, and he started going crazy as an indie artist. And I brought him in the building, and Craig, my boss, was in, an, in another meeting at the time with some pretty important, powerful people. And Chance had a short window, and it was like, okay, Craig is in this important meeting, but I got Chance the Rapper here. 
So I took it upon myself to, I just interrupted Craig's meeting. I went in there like, yo, um, you know, I just, I just bust in like, yo, Craig, I need to, I, I got somebody here. I need you to meet. And I told him chance the rappers here. And he was like, okay. And he, he kind of came out real quick, just shook the hands and, and then went back in his meeting and needless to say, we didn't sign chance. By the time we had put our offer in, every other label was trying to sign him. And at that point, he didn't even want to sign with a major, and he never did. So I don't look at that as – I didn't pass on him. I, I feel like are there things I could have done – I could have gone a little harder to get the deal done, right? Like I said, there's certain levels to it where you're like jumping on a plane and following this kid on the road and all these different things that – that we could do to close a deal. And I didn't do that. But again, the fact that he never signed to a major makes me think, even if I had did all this crazy stuff, he probably still would have just did the indie route. So I don't necessarily look at that as a loss. It was just like, I had him in the building and I just didn't close, but nobody ended up closing. So I don't feel right. that bad about it. Um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Those are two examples. Everything else is pretty much, you know, the way the game is now. Everybody pops up on research. Every label sees it. We all have the ability to sign it, but it becomes the thing of, you know, this deal is going to close for $2 million because every label's throwing up the money. Do you want to be the guy that pays 2.5? <laughs> you know, and I'm like, nah, <laughs> I'm, okay. I'm okay. I'm good. You know what I mean? So, there's a lot of that, but I don't look at those as losses because it's still got to make sense. Um, still got to make business sense for the company. And, and I don't want to be in the game, you know, doing two, $3 million deals regularly. So some of those, I just kind of let, let those go wherever they may go. We spoke about marketing earlier. We spoke about buzz earlier. Random question for you. Would you have signed six nine? Wow, that's a great question. <laughs> At what point? <laughs> think, think about that one. <laughs> At what level? Now, in now, and the reason I asked you this, right? You know, business is business. I get that six nine is he broke the cardinal rules of the streets. But you're not on the streets. You're in the building, and your primary job is to sign talent that will sell records. Right. So I have to ask you, where's the line at? Or is there any line for you? Is it just business? Look, I don't have nothing to do with what that man did in the courtroom. That's right. not my, you know, that's not my concern. Right. I know he has a huge buzz. His streaming power is off the charts. Mm -hmm. And we need to be in business with this type of artist. So I ask you again, success. Would you have signed 6 9 I would have signed 6 9 2 years ago when he first popped. Okay, I, I, I guess I'm asking. <laughs> I want to be more specific. <laughs> Would I have signed after, after, after he came home or, or while he was locked in? And if, if I gave him ten million. No, absolutely not. You would not have. No. Really? For ten million? No, I don't know. Okay. I would, there's no. So it was, it was the number. It wasn't necessarily the principle. Correct. Would you have signed him for half of that? When he came out, no. Five million? No, nah, I just would I wouldn't have done it. Like I so what I'm saying is there's still a level of integrity that we that I have specifically. You know, every executive is different, every A and R is different. Um clout culture, I get it. It's a big part of the culture now, right? Take, for instance, I signed a kid from Detroit uh, the end of last year. His name is TJX6. TJ is the leader of this new movement called Scam Rap. 
So 20, 25 years ago when cats like Jay-Z and them was rapping about selling drugs and what they did, you know, back then drug dealers was the guys with the flashy cars and the money in the club. Now there's a new culture, it's scammers. Scammers got, got the hottest, the, the, the bottle service in the club and scammers got the hottest cars and, 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 and they're flashy. They got all the high end fashion and jewelry. So there's a real, there's a real culture in the scam life. And so this kid from Detroit, TJ X six popped up and he was pretty much rapping and, and, and narrating the scam culture the same way that rappers in the 90s started talking about the, the the drug culture and so i was i was sort of mesmerized like wow he's telling and if you if you're not familiar go check him out because he he shot a video in walmart talking about <laughs> <laughs> here's what i do here's how you do it go up to the cash register and do this and put the TV in the, in the, in the, in the cart and swipe the cart. Like I was like, wow. And it was going crazy. The kids was loving it. So I was like, wow. And, and his antics is, is similar to six, nine, but he's not like chasing clout, trying to beef with everybody. But, but he, it, 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 it is, it does fall under the clout culture. So, my point is when six nine first popped up, I'm gonna keep it real. I didn't I didn't enjoy his music, the first couple songs, but when I saw the way the kids were connecting with him and I was like, okay, this kid's got a crazy strong fan base, then the executive in me would have been like, Yeah, I would I would go into business with that kid because he's managed to he's managed to bring this all this attention to himself. And and then he had the Nicki record, and I was like, wow, now he actually got a hit record. And so at that point, yes, after everything, after going to jail, coming home, would I have would I have signed him at that point? Nah, because my integrity, you know, my morals, where I came from, how I grew up, I I wouldn't have I wouldn't have done it at that level. But two years ago, I would have signed him, if that makes sense. No, it makes sense, and I'm glad you answered the question. Um, <laughs> you know, that, that's a fine line we're dealing with. Um, you know, it is a question of integrity versus just straight business. Is it just about dollars and cents? But thanks for asking, for answering the question <laughs> as honestly as possible. Um, yeah. Before I let you go, there was once upon a time where the cardinal sin in rap was yeah. biting what I'm writing. Sounding like the next man. Yeah. There were major beefs with major artists back in the days because they felt like, yo, you biting my style. But now yeah. it seems like people can't get a deal unless they sound like somebody else. For you as an a and how important is originality? Or is it just about get your weight up? Stream, show me that you can sell records. I don't care what you sound like or who you sound like. I think nowadays, especially again, I think with streaming, the 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 numbers show us who people want to listen to, right? When you and I were probably coming up, radio dictated a lot of what people were forced to hear. Right. Even if you didn't like an artist's first song, it, the money and the campaigns that went into radio and, and, and MTV and videos, you were forced to get whoever the world and the corporations wanted you to like because it was everywhere you turned. Nowadays, I'm on Spotify. I can go to this particular playlist or I could create my own playlist and listen to whatever unknown kid that I like that I just want to listen to. And when I work out, I can listen to whatever playlist I want to work out to. And if I'm in the car or taking the train, I can play it on my Spotify, Apple Music, Tidal, et cetera, whatever I want to listen to. So I'm not confined to only listening to Hot 97 or Power 105, listening to Drake every five songs. 
So I think in that regard, streaming shows us that, okay, Travis Scott is melodic, Young Thug is melodic, Little Uzi is melodic, A Boogie is melodic, you know, Future is melodic, Drake is melodic. So does that mean I'm not going to sign a melodic artist? No, because on certain levels, a lot of these guys may sound the same, right? Young Thug gets compared to Wayne, these people, you know, so melodic is melodic. Um, however, I don't, I, I just think if the fans, if, if the fans are connecting with that artist, I'll sign them. I don't think it's as big as everybody, you know, sounding the same. So, so to answer the question, no, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, you know, I, I don't not sign an artist because he sounds like somebody else. Got you. Last question for you. Does it matter if an artist comes to you and they're already signed to a production company? Do you prefer to sign artists directly or it doesn't matter to you? If they're signed to a production company, that's just fine. You'll do business with the production company and let the production company take care of what they need to take care of with their artists. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, you, you'd hope that the team is a great team. Like I said, I got into business with, with Art at War, which is James McMillan's company. The first, be, you know, way before Corday and Almighty J, it was YB and Namir. And YB and Namir blew up, went viral. And when I dug into it, I, f I realized that, oh, James McMillan, is a partner so i then was was dealing with james mcmillan um every situation every team is not going to be as resourceful as like a james mcmillan so it's like you you would hope that the team the production company the manager whoever's behind the artist is resourceful and able to get things done accordingly um because the reality is Bad, poor management can be the 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 life of your artist. Like you could, you know, there's artists that are amazing talent, but because of poor management or poor team, they're not seeing the full potential. And, you know, as a company, we do have to protect the investment because if we're investing millions into these artists, we'd like to hope that the very least they have a good team that can support the things that we put, you know, in front of these artists. So um, the answer to your question is no. I've signed artists that only had a manager directly to Atlantic. And then I've signed artists that were signed to a production company um, and, you know, ended up bringing that production company to, to the label. So I don't, it doesn't matter if you, you know, if you have a vision for that artist and, the, the artist team is on the same page as you, then I think it'll work either way. Uh, but like I said, if you are signing a production company or this artist that signed to a company, you would just like to hope that that team is able to get things done um, and, and, you know, have the expertise and have resources and, and, and able to put their artists in position to win. Um, Cause again, that's a big thing people do not understand enough in the industry that poor management can make or break the artist. It doesn't matter what the label is able to do. If I'm investing millions into an artist with poor management, I just wasted millions. I know I said that was my last question, but I want to touch on that for one second. Yep. Would you walk away from an artist and artist, listen, Listen to this part right here because there's so many people who come into the game and they have homeboy management yeah. or they have this false sense of loyalty where they're hanging on to somebody who doesn't have the skill set, who doesn't have the connections, the relationships, yeah. doesn't understand the industry, but he's been there or she's been there from day one. Will you walk away from an artist if you feel as though their management is not on point? Yes. 
I'm going to say yes, because, again, I've seen some situations where, again, management couldn't support the opportunities that was put into play. And, you know, that's a big part of it. Like, you know, everybody wants to be a millionaire and get to the bag and be flexing on the gram and go buy that big house and all of that. But it's like, if your management is, you know, in the club fighting in VIP section, (laughs) (laughs) or if your manager got locked up last night and you got to do the tonight show today. And it's like, yo, what happened to manager? <laughs> so, you know, I'm telling you, there's some, there's some, you know, Oh, my manager got caught with the gun at the airport. Really? Like, you know, so there's certain basic, basic common sense skills. That it's just like, it becomes the blind leading the blind. Yes, I will walk away from that because, you know, talented as they are, if 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 it's if there's no guidance and and no real team, professional, you know, um, you know that can like I said that can make and break an artist. Every label has artists sitting on the label that that are not reaching their full potential right now because the manager just doesn't have those skills or those resources or those connections or the know-how or the, the, um, you know, we, cause another thing that a manager should have a, a skill is, is knowing how to make and create opportunities for the artists. If you're the manager that's just like, yo, I can't wait to sign with this label. So the label can do everything. Cause I don't know anything that's all bad. Like we like managers that have some sort of vision and what they don't know, they figure it out. They go out there and they get a mentor or they get with some people and they ask questions and they figure it out. And if, if, if an artist is between albums or not in the album cycle, that manager and that team is able to keep their artists active until it's ready for the next, the next rollout or the next visual or the next tour um, and, and, you know, unfortunately there's some guys that don't have that and that's a big deal. I'm sure every label goes through that where poor management is just like, yo, everybody sees the potential of this artist and, and the fans love this artist, but the team is at a point where they, they just don't know how to get that artist to the next level. And there's only certain things the label can do. And, you know, so some guys are just stuck because of poor management. And so, you know, sometimes it's, it's contractual stuff that we can't get involved in and we don't like to get involved in. But, you know, you got to think if we're if we're investing millions, you know, you can't tell me you just, you know, you were supposed to do the Super Bowl. <laughs> and because your manager didn't wake you up that morning, you missed your flight. And now you can't do that show, that TV look, because you missed your flight. That's poor management. I wouldn't even blame the artist for that. Like, if you can't get the client to the to the show, you can't you can't get him to the to the finish line. That means that's that you know you that's poor management. So things like that are a big thing, man. That that I'm sure every you should ask every A and R person. That's a big deal. Poor management is bad bad for the company, bad for the business. And, you know, artists, sometimes by the time the artist figures it out, it's too late because, you know, their window has, has passed now. So I definitely would walk away from artists with poor management. Um, Especially if there, if there's no, if down the horizon, you, there's no change. Like this guy is signed to this guy in perpetuity. Oh no, I'm cool. I'm good. I'm good. (laughs) Unless somebody else deal with that. Artists, I hope you are listening because, you know, me having worked on the marketing and the promotion side, I cannot tell you how many artists would have been so much bigger if they had just had good management, great representation, a great team who was knowledgeable, who were on point because the artist is going to be who the artist is going to be. But Mm -hmm. you can't 
have your management that they don't have their act together. So I hope if you don't listen to anything else in this um, interview, this is something you really need to pay attention to. Success, you have been uh, great. I think you have provided so much really, really insightful information coming from a person who's in the building, has sign and power. I know you're in high demand because everybody wants to be an artist and with the uh, with the with the with the technology being what it is today, any and everybody can make a record and think that they are an artist. So thanks for your time, thanks for your insight, and thanks for being willing to share. Um, I would love to have you back on the show in the near future, whenever your time permits. If people are looking for you, how can they find you? So I'm on um, Instagram, Success Ready, uh, S U C C. E S S R E A D Y. Um, yeah, pretty much Instagram is, is my main platform. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, my government is Yasiel, Y A A S I E L, last name Davis. But um, everybody on the music industry side calls me success. So I'm out there. I'm, I'm, I'm in the, you know, I'm going to showcases. I'm responding to DMs because I, you know, I'm, I'm out there. I'm, I'm, I'm accessible and um, yeah, feel free to, 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 you know, tap in with me. I'm around. I made it a point not to put your government in this interview, um, <laughs> but, but I see you did. So no worries. Um, but thanks again, brother. I appreciate you much love and continued success. I love what you're doing. I think that the artists that you're signing, they are the future. I love Corday and all that he's putting out. So you know, continue success to you. No pun intended. Thanks, bro. I appreciate you having me. And um, yeah, till next time. Love to come back on. Be good, brother. All right, bro. What's up, guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, Feel free to share. Peace and love.